Today, I want to tell you about a personal favorite mod of mine. One that is not yet finished and yet more finished than a lot of mods will ever be. A mod that also surprisingly gets very very little coverage online in terms of videos about it. Underhell. Underhell is a horror action mix mod that features what I believe to be the best 10 minutes I've ever witnessed in a Half-Life mod near its ending. Just don't skip ahead though, as it won't make sense without knowing the entire game's story. Don't worry, the story of this game and the game in its entirety is incredible throughout, not just for 10 minutes near the ending. There will be plot twists after plot twists throughout this game. In this video, I will basically be doing a mix of a review, analysis and story retelling as it's happening. A bit of backstory on the mod though. Underhell very first saw the light of day in form of a prologue released in 2011, with announcements that there will be multiple chapters releasing of this mod. Well in 2013 we finally got chapter 1. Not to spoil the surprise twist too early, but this is the last chapter we ever got. It is however a very long mod, even with only one chapter thus far. As usual, I truly very highly recommend playing this mod for yourself, as I couldn't possibly do the story justice by just retelling it and it will be spoiled. Leave me, there are twists and turns in the story that you wouldn't expect. I do have to warn you, these first couple of minutes the story will be really messy. Afterwards it will be much more linear, after which it gets even more messy, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. I will recap you here after the first bit of messy story is over though. But yeah, let's get right into it. Before we do that, 95% of you aren't subscribed. If you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so. Once you open the game, there will be two options, the house and chapter selection. We get into what the house means in a short second. For now, you'll want to start a new game and choose the first chapter. We hear someone talking to us. Jake? Jake, can you hear me? Hang in there. I'm gonna take care of you, buddy. The intro plays with a very beautiful soundtrack. We get a view around the house, which is also the house mentioned in the main menu. We see ourselves lying on the couch watching TV. The news are on and it seems like a major hostage situation is taking place in the city. We take control of our character and immediately receive a phone call. It's someone called Frank. He says that there is a situation and we need to come down there ASAP. What follows is an intro to the house. The house acts as a hub between the chapters. Everything you need is here. You can find objects and uncover mysteries. Every locked door has a key. The house has a day and night cycle and we can even go to sleep. There is also a tutorial included by clicking on an image, which we'll get into in a bit. You can collect mementos in a shelf. It's basically an achievement trophy collection, even though there are no direct achievements. You can check hints by pressing tab. You might notice how this mod features cutscenes, which is generally frowned upon in Half-Life mods. Though I think that goes mostly for mods that play in the Half-Life universe. I personally really enjoyed the cutscenes here. Our first objective is to get our gear out of the garage to the truck. The game has a bit of a spooky vibe. It also has no manual saving. You could probably force it using the console, but the console itself mentions that messing with the intended settings could break the game. The game is mostly fair in how it saves. Also, the house can be accessed directly from the menu as mentioned, and it will always be in the state that you left it off at. I don't really know how this was done in Source, but it's really cool. You can start to move around the house now and get to know it. What you'll probably come across first is a diary, which is only labeled Her Diary by a hot hint. It is about the life of a Japanese girl that only recently moved to America. It's about her struggling to fit in and moving away again after only recently having found friends. This diary is missing a ton of pages, which we can find around the house. We will get back to the diary later. I won't get into every single thing that can be found around the house as there is really a lot. I will mention noteworthy things here and there though. By the way, I mentioned the creepy vibe already, but this house is fucking scary. I should perhaps mention that I am really bad with horror games and I can't for the life of me stay in this building. I dreaded making this video because of the house. The house has a lot of random events that can happen, all of them being pretty paranormal. Moving into the garage, we'll automatically start the tutorial, which also shows us that we are a trained SWAT unit. The tutorial takes place two years earlier. This training is nothing special really, it's split into three parts and does a good job at teaching you the mechanics. There is a stamina meter that drains from sprinting, jumping and kicking, which is also a new mechanic in this game. Our flashlight has a separate meter that can actually fully run out. We need to collect batteries in order to keep the flashlight on. Depending on the difficulty you set, it will run out quicker and you'll also find less loot throughout the game, including batteries. We also get night vision that consumes twice as much battery, but is also mentioned to not be as noticeable as a flashlight in cases where you want to remain hidden. The game also features an inventory system. You can stash medkits, food and flares in there. Food is used to heal a bit and to increase your stamina regen, I think at least. It's this bar on the side. An interesting thing to note is that the game is made by the same people that made Nightmare House 1 and 2. You'll find references to that mod throughout. You get your hands on your first weapons and they feel incredible. You're also only able to carry one weapon per slot. After completing the training, we are officially a SWAT unit and we get sent back to the garage. We load the truck and the game starts off in a helicopter. We see the same guy that we saw in the training, Frank. Frank is the same person that caught us at the beginning of the game as well. He tells us that there's a terrorist attack in a hospital in the city. We will be dropped off nearby. 
Apparently, people just stormed in the building and took a bunch of hostages. The whole city is locked down. This first part is great, a great introduction to all the mechanics and the weapons are so incredibly good as I said. This level is really fun. There is even a bit of a side story with another hostage situation here. Also I must mention, usually in these videos I disable my HUD, so that the screen is a bit clearer. This wasn't possible here though, because the weapon didn't work when scoped with the HUD disabled. They would just shoot in a random direction, so yeah, apologies for that. Most of the time the HUD will be enabled. You will also see that I am using God Mode and Infinite Stamina. Don't worry, I played through the game without cheats already. I had to play through the game again to get footage and I wanted to save some time. There are some cool details like being able to kick the helmet off of dead bodies, which will add a bit of armor. Though I'm unsure how this makes sense exactly, I am imagining the protagonist gluing helmets all over himself. We eventually find a hostage that tells us that the other hostages are not here. He doesn't know where they are, but it's not in the hospital. We hear through the radio that there is a basement area to the hospital, which is where we need to head to. We get into the sewers and learn that the effort of pumping the water out of this place would require two years of planning, which is a lot of effort for such a random act of hostage taking. We learn that a bomb went off in a train station nearby. We get to said train station and then have to free hostages. We also fight a helicopter. The only helicopter I've ever seen that is not fought with explosives in a Half-Life mod. We get down to the parking garage where some other SWAT units have been pinned down. We fight our way down the parking lot. Cool detail to note is that certain cars have alarms. Just a nice detail that caught me off guard. Upon reaching the bottom we find it guarded by turrets. Then a cutscene place where we see Frank arrive in his helicopter. We also see a ton of Humvees driving into the parking lot. Frank mentions that these are not for the military. The terrorists have access to military vehicles. We now have to fight our way back up this parking lot against new special enemies. They kinda remind me of the Black Ops of Half-Life 1. I must say this is a bit of a thing that you'll notice throughout this game. Backtracking happens a lot and is often pretty tiresome. You now have to run up a couple of floors that you just went down. Each floor takes legit like a minute to run up because this area is so huge. Backtracking can be fine, but especially with the limited stamina it is even more painful. We talk with Frank who says that we're done here. Right after which his helicopter gets shot down by some unknown thing. We only see the back of it. Now obviously this game, besides a bit of paranormal things happening, has kept a rather serious tone. Now we start chasing Frank's killer who runs at inhuman speeds and through walls. Our stamina does not decrease here, probably symbolizing the adrenaline we are experiencing. Keeping up the pace is really hard, and it is possible to lose it. While chasing it you will catch a few glimpses and see it is a very fantasy-like creature, a robot or something. If you do manage to track it down, you are able to kill it using explosive barrels. This doesn't change a whole lot except for you getting a trophy for it in your garage. Then, no matter if you catch them or not, support arrives and we drive down the parking lot with the hammer ourselves. It's a bit clanky, but I take it over going down there by foot another time any day of the week. We drive through the turret barricade and down further. A ton of Humvees are stationed down there along with terrorists. We drive through a glass wall and through a brick wall, which takes us to some sort of underground complex. We fight through some underground officers and find a hostage who says he can help us. They open a door for us, which really leads to question what kind of hospital this is. What follows is one of the raddest moments of this mod. We then walk past some kind of gas chamber, in which we hear someone screaming. We see monitors with the company name UDRC on it. Then we see a room with truly a ton of hostages, guarded by the Black Ops soldiers we saw earlier. The room we're standing in then gets closed down and we get gassed. We briefly see a vision of our house, we then awake in a different room, the one where we saw the other person getting gassed. We hear two people debating outside the window, one arguing that the plan was to only gas people that were on the list and that gassing us would cause them trouble. The other one says that we killed way too many of their guys and that we deserve it. We see the other guy we heard screaming earlier, who looks really messed up from the gas. They start to let the gas in. Instead of dying though, we somehow move through the complex in odd ways and kill absolutely everyone. Police arrives and finds us in a pile of dead bodies. Afterwards we see a very long cutscene of the camera moving around the house. We see an image of us with what can only presume to be our dead wife, the one that wrote the diary. We see her playing the piano, after which she disappears. We then awake sitting at a table with a guy sitting across from us. He says that he is our lawyer and much more. We aren't yet arrested but we are the prime suspect in what is a national tragedy. Everyone in the USA is afraid. A ton of people including citizens, suspects and police were murdered. Evidence is still being gathered though. The lawyer asks us if we can remember anything. After receiving no answer he assumes that's a no. A cop enters and shouts at us that we're going to hell. 
the lawyer asks him to leave and tells us that this cop lost a body of his. There is a cut in the cutscene and we hear someone arguing with someone in front of the door. One person says that this is our jurisdiction and asks, who the hell do you think you are? To which the other person responds, You don't want to know. Take him away. This person did indeed take us away. The next scene has us being escorted as a prisoner in a helicopter. Along with a few others, we are flying to the middle of the desert to some kind of military facility. We fly really deep into it. Before the next level loads though, we are back in the house. We still have to do some things here in order to progress. Honestly, I'm not sure if this was possible to happen before, but now the house starts to get really scary. We occasionally see glimpses of our wife, kinda like those shitty haunted G1 maps if you've ever played them. This shit gets me though, I'm so bad at horror of all kinds. So yeah, I had a hard time with this. Exploring around the house further, you'll find a map, which includes a big back garden which is missing, including a well. When night falls and you go to sleep, you have the option of hanging up a dream catcher. If you don't do so, you can play through a couple of nightmares. You will eventually be forced to play these either way. These will add a bit of backstory and are pretty creepy to play. One character to mention is your guild. At one point you find a note saying, my guild. When I hear it coming, I must start hiding. After hiding, you'll see it looking for you, promptly running away again. The backstory we learn in these dreams consists of a dialogue between Frank and your father. To summarize the story here across the four nightmares, Thomas Hawkfield, your father, asks Frank to take care of you like you are his own son. Frank asks what happened. Thomas only responds that there was an incident in which we, Jake being your name by the way, barely made it out alive and that he has to go back or else they'll know it was him. Thomas thanks Frank for everything and says that this is the last time they'll ever see each other. One noteworthy detail in that conversation, at one point Frank asks Thomas, what have you been doing down there? This could possibly relate to the facility under the hospital or to something else later on. Your past seems pretty troubled, left behind by your father after some almost deadly incident that he seems to have caused. A wife that died and now Frank has died as well. After completing all four nightmares, a tree outside your house gets struck by lightning. This has no further importance as of right now. The next day you hear something from beyond the fog in front of your house and you walk into it. You will get teleported into this room where you see two lights flashing in front of doors. Then the story continues where it left off. Okay, the story stops being so messy here for now. To very quickly recap what has happened thus far. Your father, Thomas Hawkfield, is the reason you were involved in that almost deadly incident. He then left you to his friend Frank, because they otherwise know it was him. Frank, basically your father figure, trained you and was eventually probably the reason you joined the SWAT. You and your wife, who came over from Japan and has struggled finding friends in the past, moved into a house. After which your wife died. Your house is haunted by a spirit. Sometime later, you get caught into a hostage situation in the city. You mostly resolve it, after which Frank gets killed by some supernatural cyborg alien. You either kill it or you don't. Afterwards, you move down the hospital parking lot and find a facility. You see a ton of hostages and then get gassed, which instead of killing you, leads to you killing everyone there, including the hostages. You're not yet charged with anything, but your lawyer, who also says he's a lot more than just a lawyer, wants you to prepare for a possible charge due to the entire nation being afraid. You can't remember anything though. You then hear that someone unknown is talking to a cop outside of the room you sit in. Someone mysterious who tells the cop that they wouldn't want to know who he is and then tells someone to take us away. After what seems like a time skip, you end up being escorted to what can only be assumed to be a very high security prison. You go back to your house, which now is most likely just a memory. You move past the fog in front of your house and see this double door with two lights flashing. This is where we have left off for now. I promise you now things will get more linear. You are being escorted into a prison cell. You take control of your character here. In third person, the level design I must mention is done really well. The game will save each time you sign your name onto a board, which is the only kind of manual saving we get. We get escorted into our prison cell. Moving through the prison, we get some world building, like finding out that a lot of people seem to die in these cells. After sleeping our first night and wanting to go meet a guard in the locker room, we hear some guards mentioning a certain hermit living in the vents and that it's weird he isn't affected by the airborne disease going around the prisoners currently. The hermit has been cleaning the vents and stealing stuff from the guards since his place was built. Listening to conversations and just looking around you will hear and see a ton of questionable stuff. This prison does not seem to be a normal prison in any way. Now it's simply impossible for me to mention every small cool detail you can find because else this video would be 10 hours long. Just know that it's filled to the brim with world building, great details and oftentimes foreshadowing in conversations you listen to. We meet this person here for the first time, the first guard we've seen without a mask and helmet. He's a pretty funny character. Hey, one wants to piss in this guy's ears for 20 minutes. Give me that little piece of paper so you can sign it. Ah, uh, you mean the checkpoint? Yeah, the fuck point. Hey, hey Baldi, sign it up. He also proceeds to warn us of the disease going around and that we should stay away from coughing people. We get to talk with the warden. He says that we'll be locked up here for a while. He seemingly lost his temper. The guard mentions that the warden usually talks for 20 minutes. 
We also meet the cook for the first time who gives us some food. He seems not so fond of Americans. From his accent, it seems like he is Russian. While going through the showers, we get into a prison fight, after which we get knocked out by guards. We see the house again, we hear the lawyer talk again, asking us if we remember anything. We hear Frank and the mysterious man in front of the door. The cop who says we go to hell for murdering his friend. The house is mirrored and illuminated by a weird light. The only path leads down to a place that looks like that of our nightmares. Our guilt is looking for us again. We hide and it goes away. After climbing through a vent, we see the same doors again. We try to reach it, but it moves away. Eventually, we get through it though. We awake in a high security cell, which we have been transported to. The prison is completely empty though. Well, not quite. The airborne disease seems to have spread and it's a zombie virus. This is where the game truly begins basically, and is probably not what most people imagined when they played those first SWAT levels. Remember that this is all just part of the first chapter. And just so you know, this part is probably about 12 hours long. You will notice that you can find playing cards here, for a total of 52. These can be found across the entire game. We get back to those in a bit. We move through the prison, now filled with infected. This part is so scary and well made. You're basically sneaking by zombies and hiding in closets if they do spot you. These zombies are fast ones by the way, so it's incredibly scary once one of them spots you. Giving the player no weapon at all is a great choice and makes you feel incredibly helpless, which is what you want in a horror mode. By going into a vent in a side room, we'll actually find the hermit we heard talks about earlier. You can find him multiple times in the vents throughout the game and he's also the one that wants the playing cards. By collecting all of them, you unlock an extra scene at the end of the game. If it's worth it, I'm honestly not sure, but we'll get to that later. If you like scavenger hunts, you will enjoy collecting the cards. We then fight off against our first boss, the cook Victor. A pretty cool boss battle that ends in him being grinded up. We eventually get to meet a big team of guards that survived, including the guy we met earlier, Brian, and his brother, who he mentioned he was looking for, Junior. There is a group leader, Terry. There is also Hector, Kekio, Benjamin, who is a tech guy, and Matthew, and someone named Malcolm, who we only hear over the radio thus far, and is the only surviving one in the sector. They tell us about a mission. Basically, we need to reach a big generator. To get there, we need to get to the core first. We can only get there if we allocate energy. We need to disable the energy in our sector in order to open the door to get to the big generator to hopefully escape. Sounds simple enough. We move out to disable three generators with Hector. On the last one, we get warned by Benjamin that there is something huge coming. Hector gets killed in front of our eyes and we see the brother of Victor, Igor. We climb across the ceiling boards. Igor will try to impale you through them, which is a really cool idea. We escape narrowly and move into the North Wing, where Matthew and Take You went. As I mentioned earlier, this game is partly as long as it is because it includes a huge amount of backtracking. You will usually be introduced to a huge area and then have to run back and forth about 20 times. The game at least gives you some clues, but sometimes these can be pretty unhelpful. They mostly are helpful though, just to be fair. You'll most likely find yourself getting tired of running through the same area again and again and searching for things with your limited stamina. This is however the biggest complaint there is in this game, which is one of the better biggest complaints you can have about the game. Everything else is great. We eventually get a gun pulled on us by someone we haven't seen before. Luckily, Matthew is here as well. Matthew found a few more survivors, Eric, Todd and Carl. Take you as disappeared. We also see Malcolm for the first time. We have to leave Malcolm behind because his door doesn't open. We have to disable the power and later get back to him once we have core access. We disable the power. It's possible to actually lose two of Eric's team here. But if you're careful enough, you can lose none. We then find Brian, who says that he wanted to join us from the beginning, but didn't want his little brother coming along and having to care for him like a child. He says that he is sleeping right now. Immediately afterwards, Junior shows up and says, Why? God damn it, Junior! They get into a bit of an argument. Brian tells Junior that he can't focus around him. He forces Junior to escort Eric to the control room. These two characters are probably the best written ones. I really enjoy watching them interact. They obviously love each other as brothers, and Junior seems like he wants validation from his brother, and to just genuinely spend time with him. Brian says that he can't concentrate when he's around, which honestly just seems like his way of keeping his brother safe. He knows what he's doing is dangerous, and rather wants Junior to stay safe. We are of course only about 20% through the story as of right now, so let's see how the dynamic develops. Together with Matthew and Brian, we move into the core, the place where the helicopter flew down in when we arrived. By the way, as a quick side note, the music throughout this mod is so good, like genuinely. All the music I've used in this video is from the soundtrack of this mod, it's incredible. On our way back to Malcolm, we hear him get slaughtered on the radio. We tell him to activate the automated cycle so that we can still move through. The door opens. Malcolm is dead though, only a blood trail of him being left. We find the train. 
though it would be stupid to try and take it, as it can only be started from the top floor. If we did manage to reach the top floor, the surface is already just a step away, it would not be worth it to run down again to get on the train. Our mission now is to move down to the generator level, turn it on and then take the lift up. We try to take a lift, but it's broken, so we have to take the stairs. Which Benjamin alludes to being dangerous over the radio. While moving through the sewers, we fall into some sort of chute in the water, separating us from Matthew and Brian. We hurt our legs and lose all our items. I think this decision was good. Well, I think this game thrives in both types of portions, the ones where you're alone and the ones where you're with your team. Getting pulled out of the comfort of having people by your side for a bit adds to your appreciation of said comfort once you do reunite. Never have I felt more tense than running around the facility of Underhill on my own especially with little weapons and items. As I mentioned, item spawns scale with difficulty. Ammo in general is pretty scarce and is basically close to unavailable when playing on hard. It adds to the survival feeling though and never feels unfair. We then start fighting our way through zombies trying to get back to Brian and Matthew. We move through our giant warehouse and labs after finding a gas mask. On this mission we actually find the main generator and manage to start it up. After this, Brian and Matthew arrive. They were stuck in a lift until the power went back on. We move back into the core on our way back to the crew where we see a helicopter. Someone flew down here. Nobody can be found though. Suddenly the door to the south wing, which is where we want to go to, opens. Still nothing to be found. Once we almost reach the room where the crew was at previously, we hear shooting. We see a couple of dead Black Ops soldiers we saw earlier, their actual name being PMCs. I'm pretty sure PMC literally just stands for private military company. Benjamin managed to kill them. Junior got hurt, but will be fine. Take your rice back after he was presumed dead. He had an encounter with Igor, he says, also with the hermit. Benjamin hacked into the security database. Among other things, he learns that the automatic doors are controlled by chips that are built into the shoes. Depending on what level of security clearance you have, you get a different chip. He also sees a certain code red was initiated. Terry immediately exclaims, Oh no. What does it mean, Terry? Code red. Uh, not again. He explains that there used to be two of these facilities and that he had worked at both, training new guards. He switched back and forth between them and was one of the very few that was allowed to go to the surface. The other one once had a code red. Code red means that everyone higher than security clearance 3 has to disable everyone below that level. This would include all of us besides Terry himself. Matthew asks why code red was initiated at the other facility. Terry explains that there was a strange infection at that facility. People were rotting alive. It was spreading really fast. They started killing the carriers, hoping that the scientists would quickly find a solution. Everyone was confused and people were killed once they had a regular cough, until everyone became paranoid and started killing each other. I'm gonna let Terry explain this next part himself. Among the chaos, some of the personnel managed to escape the complex. The local security couldn't contain the situation. That's when they called Ito. He called some friends and other PMCs, brought an entire army, and started cleaning in the good old shoot first, ask later fashion. The scientists had at least made progress on one thing. They discovered that some people were immune, and since there was no easy way of finding out who was infected and who wasn't, Ito thought it would be a good idea to start gassing people with the virus, so that they could study the survivors and make a cure, using them as lab rats. Ito had his claws in everything. He was cleaning the place, looking for a cure, and tracking down runaways far away from the complex, capturing or shooting them on sight. It was big. Very big. The media was all over it. Everyone was afraid. A terrorist attack, they said. Hostage takers spreading chaos. The bigger the lie, the more people will believe it. Matthew asks if this is the same virus. Terry is unsure because they always burned the bodies of the dead. He wouldn't know if they stood back up or not. It looks like it though. Ito never found a cure. We now have both the zombies and soldiers on our back due to code red. Terry says that the zombies and soldiers will start killing each other and that waiting here for now instead of trying to escape could work since we have enough supplies. Our new goal is now to just stay here and wait. Benjamin sees a couple of survivors on this monitor, which we need to go and save. Honestly, this place is so comfy. After playing a couple of hours in constant fear of zombies coming out of every corner, basically never being safe, this place is such a nice break. I have replayed this specific part multiple times already, I just love it so much. You can talk with everyone here and get some more backstory if you want to. They'll also interact with each other and the people you rescue. Rescuing the people is optional, but it will get you a nice reward if you do find all of them. Also, to speak on the voice acting, it varies. I think in general there is no voice acting in this way I would specifically say it's bad. It ranges from alright to pretty good. Sometimes the volume is an issue though. 
you'll hear one sentence really clearly and the next one is suddenly at like half the volume. I think this is because the game was first planned to have a voice protagonist, which was only changed close to the release of the game. This led to having to re-record a lot of the lines for the NPCs. So, from what we have just heard from Terry, it turns out we were gassed with the virus back then. For some reason it didn't lead to one of the two expected outcomes. It just doing nothing or us dying. Instead, it sent us into a fit of rage. We also learned that the facility under the hospital was also one of these facilities. We now start sneaking through the rooms trying to find survivors. By the way, the zombies can actually listen for your shooting. This is such a cool detail and really adds to the immersiveness of the gameplay. Also, two-handed weapons will cause you to not be able to take out your flashlight. It's the little things that add so much. The weapons are still incredibly satisfying to use and really pack a punch. Besides the bunch of backtracking and running back and forth you do have to do rather often, you will have zero complaints gameplay-wise. I must add to the backtracking complaint that it can also be seen as a positive this late into the game. The layout of this facility, at least in the lower levels, is pretty clear now. Navigating back and forth can actually be nice sometimes, like the core being a reference point to all your adventures. I generally enjoy backtracking to the core. Rescuing these survivors would get a little tiresome if it wasn't for the great feeling you get adding to your HQ. That might just be me though. Benjamin gives us a task of stealing some of his equipment so he can get into the security systems further. For completing it, we'll actually get a shoulder flashlight. We can also do a quest for Brian, for which he gives us his shotgun. After you found all survivors, or they died, Benjamin will tell you to get back immediately. Once you arrive there, you'll find everyone screaming at Matthew. Turns out that while Benjamin was searching for everyone's names in the database, he couldn't find Matthew. During a pretty long cutscene, which is greatly written, just kinda long, it is explained that Matthew is part of an intelligence agency, not the CIA. He then tells us that he is tracked every second, but he has lost connection since everything went down here. Which means he's probably being tracked down right now, and will most likely be killed. The helicopter we saw was probably of his agency. Someone asks why this place would need to be spied out, believing that this place belongs to the government. He then goes on to explain that the government is just a bunch of systems and that nothing is real. Basically just the usual black pill kind of stuff. Terry says that he is our enemy, but we are all stuck in this together. Matthew also wants to continue working together. Our next goal is to move up. The core is good, but the doors of the upper levels can only be opened from the inside. Benjamin says that he can hack the ciphers to open the doors from the outside. For that, he will need a cipher though. Ciphers are these things here. They bump into things a lot, which they also mention in game to be the case. With a bit of pushing, it's manageable though. We move into the west wing, the residential area. We can find and save more survivors here as well. We find access cards for the elevator to go up two levels. We throw them back down for the others and then have another vision. We wake up in a random room, which we probably entered using a vent, and meet the same army that attacked our safe house earlier again. Moving into the core, we see the army and the helicopter starting. We see the sunlight for the first time in a while. After that, we find our crew again, in the new safe house. We were apparently gone for hours. This safe house is great as well. Interacting with the characters is fun, and I genuinely find myself going back here just to enjoy the atmosphere. We get briefed on this situation. Basically, the soldiers that arrived have changed the cipher codes so that we're stuck here now. The mainframe is on this level, but only behind a lab filled with toxic gas. We are the only person with a gas mask, and thus could go there and hack them back. Once we hack the ciphers, we will be going through the north wing, which Terry says is the only way back up. Benjamin can't really access info on the north wing. He says it's very scattered, which is a problem, but he says he'll keep trying. To access the labs, we need a yellow keycard. After finding it, we put on our mask and move through the labs. The mask blocks sounds a bit, and you hear your breathing. This is a bit annoying, but I guess it accurately represents wearing a gas mask in real life. Usually at this point I'd speak a bit on the weapons of a mod. But this mod, unlike most Half-Life mods, doesn't really have the same progression of weapons. In Half-Life 2 you find weapon after weapon and slowly expand your arsenal, which is what most mods mimic. Here you can only carry one weapon per slot, and there are quite a few you can find. I'm just gonna generally say that these weapons all pack a good punch, have great sound design and none of them seem to be worse than another. Just go with what you like. We manage to disable the gas in the labs. We move into the mainframe. Here you will have to do a stealth section, unless you are ready to face an entire army. Which, as I have stated, I was cheating anyways in this playthrough, so I just rushed in. I am pretty sure this would be impossible without god mode. We find a scientist that gets us the cipher codes. Another pretty important cutscene happens. Benjamin sees that Takeo doesn't have any entries in the database, just like Matthew. At that exact moment, Takeo arrives. Brian immediately holds a gun to his head and screams at him to tell who he truly is. Suddenly, there are electricity sparks and Takeo is gone. During his act of disappearance, he also took the cipher with him. Terry asks him what he's after on the radio. Takeo says he's looking for his sister. She's trapped somewhere in the facility, but he doesn't know where. Benjamin says that he can look for her in the database. 
Taku says he has done so already and couldn't find her, because she was relocated right before everything went down. The only thing Taku knows is that she's somewhere on level 3. Taku also says that he'd come back first once he found her and that he left the North Wing access opened. Terry asks what she's called, since there aren't many women working here as scientists. Takeo says that her name is Mia. At this moment, Aito joins the conversation over the radio. Takeo explains that his dad never approved of Aito's methods, only of the outcome, and that he was sent by his dad to kill Aito. I'm gonna compress this conversation into, I think, understandable terms. I had to listen to this conversation a lot to understand what was going on. So basically, Terry tells us that A, Takeo is the son of the CEO of this facility, which also means that his real name is actually Raito and not Takeo, and B, that this entire facility has a ton of side projects to increase the revenue for the main project it was built for, Janus. Janus stands for two people, East and West. Eastern Janus is mentioned to have built Chernobyl. He, she or it was a young genius. We don't learn a lot about West right now. Each time they are mentioned, it's stated that they are two opposite solutions that cannot coexist. The CEO of this facility managed to get them to work together for the first time. Janus was however simply unable to work together due to too many accidents and thus were split into two separate projects. Posterous, led by Western Janus, and Terminus, led by Eastern Janus. Matthew mentions that these projects are the reason he was sent here. Terry doesn't know all the details, but after some time, Terminus took over Posterous and Posterous shut down. The CEO of this facility has now realized that Terminus was a mistake and sent his son, Raito, to go save Mia and then clean up the mess. We also learn that Aito, besides having his PMC army that we have fought and have been fighting against, also has a triad. Each of them have a specific task. Danko, who we killed in that epic dual wielding pistol slow-mo scene, was in charge of cleaning up the mess in this facility. Marcus leads the scientist team at gunpoint to search for a cure for the infection. Then there is Royce, who is in charge to take care of runaways. Terry says that they always get the job done and are highly trained. They are loyal only to Aito. Right now, we only have Aito and Marcus looking for us, since Royce is not in the facility. Raito, according to myths Terry didn't believe previously but now does, has been trained since he was a child and now has access to experimental weapons created in this facility, like a cloak. The cloak is what he used earlier to disappear. Terry also mentions that it can't yet be fully operational or in mass production, since he hasn't yet heard about it, which means there will only be a few of them and we will still be able to see them a bit when they're using the cloak. As of right now, we don't know what Janice's goal was or is. The plan for now stays the same. Get to the North Wing and move up. We just have to be more careful. By the way, Raito's sister and daughter of the CEO, Mia, is mentioned in the diary of her wife. They were childhood friends. We go into the North Wing and see elevators which supposedly go all the way to the top. They don't work though. We need to find access to the elevator controls. Shortly afterwards we get locked in the lobby. Benjamin mentions that he has spotted a pattern in cameras that disable periodically. It is a path. The cameras right in front of a room are disabled and then we face off against the cloaked soldiers for the first time. Well, I say that, but that's not truly the case. These soldiers look the exact same as the alien creature that killed Frank back then. We fight off against a couple of them, which is quite a challenge. I know I'm in God mode in my playthrough for the recording here, but I remember this fight not being easy at all. We then fight a monitor with someone holding three hostages. We are told to surrender or else they will die. We can now either surrender or open the door to them and hope for the best. But it is a pretty long fight before you get there. If you do call this bluff, he will actually kill them. By surrendering, you will be escorted to him. Him being Marcus, part of Aito's triad, the one that holds the scientists at gunpoint. He plans to take us as a hostage as well, to which we start to fight him. By killing him this way, the scientists will survive. On our way to enable the elevators again, we walk past an ACE assembly line. These robots are actually called ACEs. Shortly afterwards, we see Mia, who then gets chased away by an ACE. We run after her, only to find her laying on the ground. Presumably passed out because there is no blood to be found. There is a journal here on the table behind us. It glows brightly and has the name Tom H written on it. This is a journal of her father. We look inside of it, but we can't see what it says. We only see the reaction of her character. The camera moves to reveal our guilt standing behind us once again. Aito enters the conversation as he stands behind the glass watching us. He starts to gas us again, saying that this time it was his command unlike last time. We have a gas mask, but instead of putting it on ourselves, we give it to Mia. This time we don't fall into a fit of rage, we just simply pass out. Our eyes open again, we see the hermit climbing out of a vent, he takes a look at Mia. Shortly after which, Raito teleports in. Raito has his own ace uniform. He picks up his sister and leaves, only glancing at us for a short moment. The hermit takes a look at us, after which we pass out. We wake up in this lair. In the lair we find a poster with an image of the hermit, saying Grandfather loses entire family. Poor guy. We also find a radio and we hear a lot of shooting and Terry calling for Benjamin. We try to get back to them and see them entering the elevator. We fend off together with Brian and Matthew and then take the next elevator. We also block their doors so that nobody can follow us. We find out shortly afterwards that everyone but the people we're seeing right here were killed. The safe house was stormed by PMC. We now arrive at the surface access. 
a bright light behind the window fills the room. Sunlight. Matthew goes to check. It's actually headlights of cars. Aito standing right between them. We see that the room is trapped with explosives. Matthew turns around to tell us to take cover and then... Matthew dies, so does Eric. The rest of us run for it and the group actually splits up because they can't decide which door to take. We can now choose to go with either Brian and Junior or Benjamin and Terry. I chose Brian and Junior. You can basically just decide which characters you like better, as you'll meet up relatively soon again. Our goal now is to get to the train. Benjamin knows how to get it running from here. After opening a high clearance door using a shoe we find, we get into a chase and fight Ben and Terry in the core. Both our groups get into an elevator. This is when the surface opens and a jet comes flying inside. The glass on the elevators is thankfully bulletproof. We get down to level 0 where the train is, open the access and as we try to close the door again after everyone entered, the jet crashes into it. Brian shoots the pilot dead. Terry tells us to hurry because Aito will soon find out that we are still alive and come hunt us. We move down to the train, Ben opens the railway doors and we all enter but Ben decides to not come with us. He explains that the pressure of the main generator we enabled earlier is off the charts. He has to go and disable it, or otherwise nobody of us will make it out alive. He wants to do this on his own because they will need to reset the generators, which will mean the train gets reset as well. Which means they have to go to the top level again before coming down. This is a suicide mission. Terry starts screaming at Ben, saying that he made a promise. As the train starts, Terry shoots the back window and jumps out of it. We hear over the radio that Terry made a promise to Ben's dying father to keep him safe. Ben says his farewells to us as we drive away in the train together with Brian and Junior. Brian and Junior obviously saddened by what happened. Junior asks Brian if he thinks they will make it. Brian thinks they will. We get stopped by PMC, which we promptly take out. Ammo is running low by now, which Brian and Junior also mention. We get stopped another two times. On the fourth time, there is nobody at the stop. Just as we are about to continue driving, Aito arrives with his PMC. We manage to get away though. As we continue driving, we get to actually see sunlight again for the first time. Just as we do that though, another train pulls up next to us, full of PMC. They take a corner door in which we ram them away and keep on driving. Which may seem a bit cartoonish, but trust me, it will all make sense in a bit. We then arrive at the last stop. We find an empty warehouse. We hear something though. As we go to check what it was, together with Brian, we find that the container on the last wagon is now open. We return to Junior and find none other than Igor standing behind him. Igor stabs Junior with a hook and hangs him up using it in the middle of the room. We fight against Igor, his weakness being sunlight. After we eventually manage to beat him due to the main door's opening, Brian lets Junior down, but it seems it's too late. Then, a sniper takes aim at her head and we get shot. We wake up again though, somehow. Brian administers us adrenaline and we receive a minigun. We storm and fight against soldiers, not PMC, these are other guys. Ryan jumps out of the wall with a weaponized vehicle. We shoot off against the entire army. As we drive away from the facility, we fight against multiple helicopters and the facility gets nuked behind us. Again, we somehow survive this. We walk through the ruins of a city and walk into a restaurant. We find the lawyer sitting here. Well, you are quite hard to track down. From here on begins probably the best 10 minutes in mods ever which I will just play for you in full now. I won't sum it up afterwards, so please watch it in its entirety, because it truly is great. If you have played the game before and know what happens, and only truly then, skip to this time. Otherwise, nothing will make sense afterwards. Honestly, I'd recommend watching it even if you have played the game in the past. But yeah, with that out of the way, enjoy. Does this place mean anything to you? You're not where you think you are. You got carried away. It's not your fault. It's hard to stay focused. I don't blame you. But now, it's time to come back. Confused? Don't be. It'll all make sense soon. I just had to wait for you to be ready. I'm gonna count to ten, and when I say ten, you will open your eyes. One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is insane. How do you expect us to believe any of that crap? You heard it yourself. You've been here the entire procedure. We all were. That doesn't mean what we witnessed made any sense. It did. You just have to pay attention to the details. His descriptions were very thorough. That they were. Thanks to him, we found a way in. Our attack team was able to successfully enter the complex from where he came out. The details? Is that what matters now? I'm sorry, but I didn't see a nuclear explosion in the middle of the city. Did you? <sighs> Don't be ridiculous. You have to learn to differentiate between memory and fantasy. This whole tale with the explosion and the ultimate destruction of the facility was an obvious stress release. Stress release? We don't have time for stress release. We need answers. How are we supposed to make sense of his ramblings if half of it is fiction? Easy. We already know what happened from the moment he was shot in the head and we took him in. So you could just forget about everything that he said after that. Gentlemen, he's awake. About time. Is he lucid? I should examine him. That won't be necessary. I'm going to need to send him back in. What, so soon? That is not safe. Oh, here we go again. Let's waste two hours hearing him fantasize about how he's going to save the world. I'm going to get a cup of coffee. I have no choice. Our men are inside. We lost radio contact. He is our only hope. If you turn him into a vegetable, he won't be able to help us now, will he? Michael, please. The procedure is already at risk due to his head trauma. If you push him too hard, he might have a seizure. He can take it. He must. Does he understand what we're doing? He'll connect the dots eventually. Won't you, Jake? Maybe you should explain it to him. Having him confused isn't helping. Jake, look at me. What do you remember? I'm telling you, you should explain everything to him. The bullet has caused a severe head trauma. It's what's causing his short-term memory loss. The harder he will try to think, the worse it will get. Jake, do you know where you are now? Of course he doesn't know. He's been stuck in his head for the past 12 hours. That is inaccurate. He was always in control. We were just guiding him. If we were controlling everything, he wouldn't have had these... outbursts of mild fantasy. Jake, everything that you just told us, all the events that you described, took place over the last week. That's right, Wacko. And you weren't sent to some underground place in Arizona. In fact, you haven't moved from this chair since 8 o'clock this morning. What is going on out there? You better go find out. Jake, look at the red light. Good. This is where everything split. Now, go back. Before the train. Before the jet. Before level five. Take me back to the north wing on level two. Take me back to the labs. Don't worry about the gas. There is no gas. You're not suffocating, you're alone. You are safe. Good. Do you see the journal? Go to it. Open it. Read it. Duality. My life seems to be full of parallel events. Intricately connected, guiding me step by step, foretelling my actions, robbing me of my free will. On one side I have my work, that will help billions and probably save mankind from being annihilated by their own mistakes. And on the other, I am the father of a dying child. Stable. 
have to stop this. We're almost there. Jake, go back in. Look at the lights. Good. Now open the journal. The bond between my co-workers and I, it goes beyond anything I've ever seen. Especially her. We all know what we have to do. We all know there is no other choice. If only he could see it. The Eastern Janus, they call him. My opposite. It seems they forget we are on the same side. One problem. Two opposite solutions that cannot coexist. Okay, we're back now. Hey, I see you. You decided to skip ahead and just hope that everything will make sense somehow. Well, tough luck. Here's a timestamp to go back if you are a skipper that hasn't played the game. Seriously, trust me. There are like 20 plot twists in there and it's truly worth watching. You will be completely lost if you don't. Alright, now that only the people that actually played the game or fully watched the cutscene are here, let's continue. I'm not gonna sum up a whole lot, but basically everything we saw was just a recreation of a memory and probably wrong in a lot of places. The lawyer might seem like he was shot dead here as well, but we actually see him escape. Him being so interested in the journal of Thomas Hawkfield, who we found out is the western side of Janus, probably means he's someone really important. On the news we see that riots have broken out across the city. Moving to this police station, we now enter chapter 2. Yes, everything up until now was chapter 1. This is only a teaser for chapter 2 though. We move around the police station. We see our wife, we see our guild. Our wife guides us to the right direction. While our guild usually leads us directly into enemy fire, we see the zombies again. So that part of her memory was actually true. We see Royce, who is here to track down and kill us. He was also the one that took us out of the police interrogation and brought us to the prison back then. We continue running away from them and end up in a room with guilt. We fall to our knees. Our wife stands behind us. Everything in the room starts to levitate. 
The soundtrack, just like all the ones in the game, beautiful. There is an electric explosion of sorts and then they're gone. PMC and Royce arrive. Royce is in Ace armor. We jump out of the window. Royce teleports away. You see us laying in the dumpster. The end. This is everything that is released thus far. Well, we're not really at the end yet. We quickly gotta continue talking about the house. Not everything is completed yet. Theory time? The house seems to be a representation of a brain slash mental state in a way. During the final times the lawyer forced us into our brain and the others warned him that this could cause us to have a seizure, we see our house get more dark, foggy and eventually set on fire. It mirrors the state our brain must be in. It would also explain us going back there in between chapters. It's of course also real, and the things we do there are probably also memories of stuff we've done. We can go back to the house after chapter 1. We can now go into the forest behind our house. We can dig up a well, which we also saw on a map we found in the attic. Here you can find out about the story of a couple of killers sent to your house to take you out, though they were stopped by an unknown counter agent. All three of them were shot in the heart and set on fire and thrown down the well. However, one of them, called Angelo, survived. He has dextrocardia, which means his heart is on the right side of the body. We can find him down here though he is pretty slow and thus not really a threat. If you find all the recordings here and listen to them, you will find a diary page and be able to go back to the house. You will then see footsteps in your house. They lead to your room where you see Angelo. He gets dragged into the bathroom, which you by the way can't open, saying I don't want to go there. After this scene, we get a key to a box in the attic and then get to cut open a fence and get a diary page again. The diary relates to some characters we know, like Mia or Junior. They seem to be old friends of our wife. It doesn't really add anything new though. Once we go back to sleep though, the nightmare room will change and we can play through all of them again, though heavily changed and now giving us a backstory on our parents. Specifically, them driving to drop us off with Frank. At the very end, after completing all the dreams, we hear someone on the phone with the lawyer, who seems annoyed how little information the lawyer got out of us. This is the full end of the story as of now, and probably forever. Chapter 1 released in 2013. The team behind Underhell, mainly the main developer... Uh, m m has since moved on to work on Insurgency and Insurgency Sandstorm, which has been and is still a huge success. The very last update on the Underhell Mod TV page was in 2016, where they talk about the development of Insurgency Sandstorm and how Source is on its way out. Well, at least up until very recently, Mr. posted an article in March where he announces he will celebrate Underhell turning 10 years old this September with a livestream. I wouldn't get my hopes up for a Chapter 2 announcement, but any kind of update on Underhell would be great which is most likely what we'll get. That about concludes the entire story of Underhell. I would say that I am very sad it never got completed, but I wouldn't say that all hope is yet entirely lost. I truly wish there would be another chapter, because the story up until now has very obviously set up a lot of characters and story arcs to happen in the future. Like for example the rivalry of Raito and Aito. Royce is a new main villain and of course what Janice truly was. But at the same time I of course respect the developer moving on to other things. I thank them for this great mod they gave us entirely for free. Posterous and terminus. Her name is you me. You thought you were special. She can handle anything. So, Jay. I thought you were special. Tell me. Ito. My father always despised you. Yes. He never approved your you methods. Now. Only your results. What was I? Kurt Ray. I can't wait to finally meet you. Not again. Ito. I've been working for this company for 12 years. This isn't the only no. facility they Are have. Are you going to spoil the fun? There was another one. I'm working for my superior. Do you have anything to say? Don't you see, dumbass? He's a prisoner. Personally, I would have put a bullet in your head. My name is Michael. And I am a lawyer, and much more. Do you know why you're here? Take you? I thought you were dead. Where the hell were you? I trusted you. Why do you think I went private? I can't fight with your next. You're day. here because many people died. Why was the code red given at the other facility? It's a direct order to everyone above security. Do people even free know to what the government is? You think it's a room full of politicians that make decisions? Are we going to chase that thing into the East Wing or what?
Well, well you, you are, are quite hard to track down. down. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Also, I forgot to mention, for collecting all the cards, you get a bonus scene with the Hermit. It's honestly a pretty cool scene. While collecting all the cards is hard, it can be worth it. Also, my rating for Underhell is 10 out of 10. I will probably upload a video where I cut together all the cutscenes of this mod, since for some reason that does not yet exist. Consider subscribing and becoming a channel member. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Idiot! Level 1 is the first floor! It's level 0! But level 0 is not a level! Come on! That doesn't make any fucking sense!